from the outside, it's really kind of nondescript, like you wouldn't imagine it to feel like this inside, I think. I find it really affecting, really beautiful place and quite a humbling place. And also really, I don't know, it's like quite disconcerting as well, like aesthetically. You could be in the middle of the countryside, but the sound of cars and industry and units is all around it. And when I started thinking about it and the, the rail lines, I was imagining it as a, you know, this place, this living entity that's just been here continuously and what it would have been like for the wood, watching all the coal going past and all that coal, which is the fossilised remains of forests going out to the river and to London and fueling the expansion of London, which didn't have coal reserves and the creation of empire. So the sense of it as a witness to history as well, a kind of standing witness to something and the fact that it is still here. So I guess that was the kind of roots of why I wanted to make a piece of work here and think about this place. Um, I think what I started trying to make is something that just tries to think about the kind of density and diversity and weight and age and longevity of the place. And just to try and really, really see it, because I think I, I kind of find this place like hard to hold in my head. It's a real sort of shapeshifter, and I think that film really is about just really looking slowly at this place and being here and being present and being open to what comes on any particular day. It's a lot about time and somehow my time, like spending time here and, and conceptually as an artist kind of giving time to something feels like it's quite an important part of the process. But also I hope that in doing that it brings some other thinking that's more about these kind of places and nature and diversity and what that means to think about that and what it tell, might tell us about our relationships to the natural world. I'm interested in the idea of like landscape as like a speculative thing in art, like that we can create a world and then see what happens within that thought experiment of that world. If we create a world, what kind of things would live there, how would things function, what would be the economics, what would be the social relations, um, that's the thing. I mean, that's not to say that the landscapes I use are not in some ways based on or sometimes completely borrowed from real life. Like, um, I've made a lot of artworks that include direct images that have been drawn or like filmed and adapted from where I live in Gateshead. Um, Take the Moonlight by the Tail, the artwork slash game that's included in Hinterlands um, includes a number of images that are from things like a nature reserve near where I live and from the castle in Newcastle. It talks a lot about like different kind of things that actually do exist, even if they are kind of presented in such an unreliable and uh, distorted way. So the landscape turns up quite a lot in there. I'm, it's something I'm really interested in. It forms... Um, this like part of a development of ideas it can be like part of the system that you kind of set in place and then see what can grow from it you create the landscape and you kind of then develop like the different lines of uh, social and ecological um, things and systems and interacting layers that can appear over the top of that so landscapes like a thing that i think about a lot in my work and it turns up in all kinds of things like um, often when I write narratives I will draw the world before I write the narrative within it I draw a map of where the thing's going to take place and then think about like well what would happen in this situation some of that's like about getting internal kind of like logic correct um, but some of it's just about like letting this thing generate its own material the sighting of the pylon in the woodland feels like a really powerful thing to me in a way because it's something that we don't like to think about we want to forget that we need quite huge amounts of electricity to power our lives and we don't really want to think about those things and so there's these kind of hugely visible but kind of slightly invisible things that are these that are threading through the country and they connect us but they are always like kind of seen and unseen at the same time. And I, those things like that that I find really fascinating in this place where they feel 
at odds with this environment maybe but in my head at least they are still deeply deeply connected they're part of the same thing this is a managed woodland and so I started recording in this place in top of our woods and in this particular pylon that I was really drawn to initially one of the things that really intrigued me about the sound was this emotional effect it had on me which was something like fear I suppose like a mixture of that and fascination and and how like I felt it in my body as much as I heard it and there's something about kind of capturing that sound and making it be somewhere else independent of the the source of that sound which was a way of kind of part of that untangling I suppose of like trying to work that out for myself like where that came from where this emotional effect came from. And originally I was trying to blot out other sounds, other kind of surrounding sounds, but then as the work progressed and developed, I actually became really interested in how those sounds overlapped with the sound of the pylon and how that located it in a place. Foundation Press um, was sort of born like within a foundation art and design course that we used to teach on. And so there's a sort of ethos of like kind of play and collaboration. We work with community publishing and collaborative design. We quite often make sort of things which we call wallpapers, but essentially are kind of poster experiments that we paste up on, on walls. And we were invited to make a wallpaper for the Hinterland show. And at that time, we'd actually been doing some conversations with a group in Teesside called the Cleveland Naturalist Field Club. And we got really interested in making it about that practice of being a field club of being naturalists as a group going out into uh, different parts of the countryside and different interests around nature and natural history. So we decided that actually the wallpaper could, should sort of celebrate that practice, that the socialness of these groups and also the rich history of them. The field club and finding out about that just became really apparent that there was this like ongoing kind of like witness to kind of nature and really taking it like quite seriously about noticing what's there still or what's gone or what's new and feeling like, you know, it's like in a massive service that they're all doing just for the love of it. So that's why we really wanted to sort of like carry on that relationship with them and um, to make this piece of work. Cleveland Naturalist Field Club, you know, we found out was formed in 1881. So it's sort of 140 years old. And we were fortunate enough to actually look at its archive which had a really rich range of photographs and uh, a real range of self-published materials actually, which we were really inspired by as self-publishers ourselves. And we started to use that content and also work with current members of that group to make a design. So I've been coming here as an artist, uh, working at Morehouse for over 10 years now, partly because it's quite a different location that's kind of accessible. It's not to do with land ownership and to do with its importance, the sort of environmental and sort of scientific climate research that's happened here over 70 years. I think a real characteristic of Peatlands is very much about kind of thinking about time not as something linear but something that exists in a sort of different way and being here has a real sense of time in another way and I think I've talked about that in various ways through my practice, how I work, how I think, and so this kind of environmental context of peatlands really feeds into that, so slowness is a huge part of how I've made work as well. So Morehouse is kind of 50 miles from Newcastle city centre where I live, so it's this constant relationship between upstream and downstream. And that's, that's really important for Morehouse and the North Pennines and Upper Teesdale and this kind of Cumbrian sort of border, which is where Morehouse is geographically situated. But it's also situated upstream of all our downstream kind of communities. Knowing that you're interconnected in some way and that there's this relation to it because of just how the rivers are flowing. These places aren't like isolated wilderness I think what I try to think about is how they're you know deeply sort of embedded or rooted in everyone's sort of day-to-day -day life that lives downstream so it's all about this kind of upstream thinking and this idea of upstream 
consciousness has been a huge part of my practice for about 10 years really guided by a place this sort of working relationship with Morehouse My work always begins in environments, so it's about the sensory encounter of environments and it's never really about one specific environment that I've gone to and then I come back to the studio to then respond directly to that one place, but it's like an accumulation of sensory encounters of various different landscapes and environments in which when I'm in there it's both the physical bodily experience of that place and then it's what I feel compelled to capture through the camera, be that on film or digitally. And it's then taking those photographs into the studio. And I always ask that question, like, why am I photographing this? And what will I do with this photograph? Like, how can I use that image or the photographic material in a kind of physical manner that really enhances or brings out some of the sensory experience that was in that, in that place? Wilding is, is a very tactile, impulsive, intuitive process and it's a kind of an approach to the photograph which is an undoing of representation to unfix the image of specifically pointing back to one specific place where it's been taken but to kind of break it open and to reconsider what meanings could come to it in its combination with other material matter. Uh, so I'm currently showing a series of five banners. I was thinking a lot about the idea of tribes and crests and the idea of people claiming lands and stakes and the idea of the community and the idea of people coming together under one symbol, one image, um, but also feeling connected through this banner so it can be something that can empower people um, and make them feel a part of something. The idea of the banners also comes from the idea of like the Durham Miners Gala as well, the idea of like people walking through a space. But these ones are made on cotton and they're hand painted with white um, fabric paint. So a lot of the symbols are symbols that are reoccurring, that I've used in previous work in textile as well as moving image. So the hand comes from the idea of the mother and the protector. We've also got um, symbols of the eye. So the eye for me is a more if that um, can protect you but also can give intent so it can be negative or positive. There's also symbols such as like the snake, there's also um, more obscure ones, there's a mushroom within one which I don't think you'll recognise, but the idea of sort of microbial growth and expansion. There's keyholes, there's the dot, and the dot is quite an important symbol, um, especially for myself because it relates to the idea of the beginning and the end of things. Everything sort of grows and expands from one point, but also shrinks back to that. And there are also things that help me feel empowered um, and feel part of a space. Taking them out into the landscape, into Chopwell Woods, after creating these, I'm sort of claiming my stake on the northeast in this region. So we're standing in the middle of what used to be Felling Colliery. So it was um, a mine for many, many years. It's a site that's contaminated from industrialization, but it's not so contaminated that it's on the contamination land registry, but it's more contaminated than they can actually do anything with. So it's, it's just left as a brownfield site, which means that there's no intervention. Um, and the plants are just kind of left to grow. And actually, ecologically, it becomes much more interesting as a brownfield site because there's not any effort to sort of contain the nature. The nature just sort of is allowed to have natural plant succession. A lot of the, what the piece is about is this tension between, you know, I'm filming in, in close and details of these plants, which is absolutely beautiful in my mind. And then it's contrasted with the unease, the fact that this is contaminated, that these plants are having to navigate, you know, industrial waste back from the industrial revolution, but also current you know, it's still being used for fly tipping, it's still, you know, there's rubbish everywhere. But this plant just continues to grow and it's really beautiful. And not, it's not just growing and being beautiful, it's, it's tending to the earth and it's making more soil. You know, so as, as all these plants grow, when they start to decay and they leave, you know, more matter and then more plants can grow and it's this process of conditioning what was concrete and which was, what was, you know, slag and and industrial waste and metal and all of this, it, it becomes fertile again by the plants. The plants do that, they actively are, are remediating this site. As I'm, as I'm looking at sites like this and this site specifically, I'm thinking about how does, how does nature handle this, this toxic residue we've left behind? 
and really nature and nature it can adapt you know and I, I don't want to make work that's like oh nature's got this we don't need to worry you know it's it's nature can adapt and there will always be some sort of natural life no matter what we do to this planet but we won't be here and we're, we're the part that's most fragile I wasn't brought up with nature. However, there's clues, there's imagery and stories that have been passed on within my maternal line. Um, my maternal line has been northeast about a hundred years, over a hundred years. A wee ginger lassie hooked up with a Ghanaian man um, who came on a ship, a stoker. And that's made that our line in the northeast. Um, and what we've got there, we've got images of them out together in the landscape, you know, walking, pausing in the grass, at the beach, and um, fooling around, having a good time. And I thought, where's this come from? I didn't know about this. So what this country, country journal of a black woman is, is me creating this composite black woman in the landscape, which is my matrilineal lineage, my maternal line in the landscape, that it's there. We have had this relationship with the landscape. It's just not been blatant or obvious or passed on, denying ourselves a lot of that connection and joy and love. And this is part of that black woman in the landscape, that feeling of belonging, but also not belonging, that feeling of like, being disconnected and connected with the landscape because there's not that many stories or visuals out there that we we be in the landscape. So to create that archive is taking what little clues that there is within my family and creating this bigger picture of yes, we have been in the landscape, we belong here, we're here now, we've been here in the past, we're here now. And like, we have a right to be taking up space in the landscape. That's why I hop in the sea. I'm the only black body on the beach, I may add. And when I strip down, I'm even more vulnerable. But there's something about that that empowers me. We're in the North Pennines, just on the edge of Woodybank Fell. This is an area of outstanding natural beauty. It's also a landscape that's very much associated with lead mining. Lead has been mined here intensively in the 19th century, but also, well, in Roman times and probably going back all the way to the Norse and prehistoric times. Uh, you might say it's, it's the most sort of industrial or post-industrial landscape in England, or certainly one of them. I look at landscapes through the language of glass. Glass as a, as a composite of environments, minerals, botanical, you know, environmental and social histories, but also that, you know, transparency is site-specific. Transparency is something that, that has an, a very specific place and a very specific history, and, and uh, you can't erase that. So I started walking here looking for a moonwort fern, which is a diminutive, absolutely tiny fern about this size, which grows on heaths and grasslands. And the moonwort is a, a plant that's seen as having powers over metal and having transformative powers. So it's, it's, it's connected to alchemy, and alchemy is connected to early glassmaking around the 1600s and early 1700s, which is when lead glass sort of starts to really develop and be produced on an industrial scale in, in, in England. Lead glass was actually developed to imitate rock crystal, and because this is an area that is very famous for its minerals, there's an oddness or a sort of a slightly perversity in, you know, heavily mining and, and blowing up a landscape to extract a material that is then used to imitate materials nat naturally occurring in that landscape. So that, that sort of sense of, of, of composing and imitating was something I was thinking a, a lot about. My land practice is my art practice and my art practice is my land practice. So my land practice is um, primary uh, rooted in my garden in Newcastle, which is on the front of my house, it's very small, and then on the back is a bit bigger. 
Uh, but yeah, the forest garden is uh, like trying to replicate nature in the same way like uh, rainforest is this amazing uh, multi-layered uh, uh, abundant uh, landscape. So with the forest garden, it tried to mimic that, creating multiple layers and creating diversity and habitats for other species. And that's where I harvest my herbs from my forest garden in the making. Um, but also another very important aspect of my land practice is foraging for wild plants. As a part of my heritage, so Polish culture is a mycophilic culture. Everyone goes seasonally sort of to forage. Um, I really could see the quality and the importance of that, how actually foraging brings you to very close relationship with your locality, with uh, plants, the multiple uh, species of plants, uh, how it allows learning and then the relationship, uh, through that relationship also care for the landscape. Because I guess through children, I really started to care for the future, not only focusing on caring for the land, but sustainable, livable, flourishing future. And this sort of understanding of what I do as land practice um, rests upon the understanding that land practice is not about agriculture, it's about having a meaningful relationship with the environment um, and caring for the environment. But I frame this within a sort of a narrative framework, looking at how mythology grows from our relationship with the land.